I'm always very pleased and honored to be here at the Future of Science. Knowing that uh, my audience is full of students and young people, I was thinking to what my grandma would say. So you do what you have to first, and then you can like you can do what you like after. So basically, I decided to divide my presentation into two. I believe that you've been presented with quite a wealth of data, even more than necessary. So I'd like to present you with very few data. One uh, hasn't been referred to so far, and I believe it is quite um, important. Uh, obviously, technology is something important, but you also have to consider um, society and the rest, and then I'll be talking about innovation. This is a piece of data that I wanted to share with you first. This is the first time that this is being shown. This piece of data has been presented by Eurostat. These are the um, EU citizens who have never had the internet. They only use uh, conventional smartphones. So how many of are they? Well, in Italy, there are quite a number. 28% of the Italian population, nearly 3 out of 10, uh, which is uh, twice uh, the European average, which is 16%. In certain countries, as you can uh, see on the map, though there are m much less of that. There are nearly next to zero, as in the Netherlands, for example. So everybody actually having an internet connection. Well, this is an important piece of information. When, whenever we refer to digital revolution, I think it is only right to highlight how many nice things are being uh, brought about. But we also have to consider that 28 Italian citizens are going to be left out. This figure has been increasing or uh, enhancing over time. Uh, between 2010 and 2015, the number of the internet illiterate declined. Uh, Bulgaria, Greece are perhaps the only countries that do worse than Italy and Romania as well. And this is not just an infrastructural data in that, that these people have no access to the internet. This is not the only problem. There's a cultural problem that I wish to highlight. This is a figure that has been made known by the ISTAT and um, confirms what the above. You see that um, in the south, basically, you have more people who have uh, um, never had contact with the, the internet and uh, people of a certain age, so older people and uh, people with a um, lower level of culture have no access to the internet. So. There's also a gender difference, especially uh, after a certain age. And then I was also referring to culture. With my colleagues, so we've been trying to introduce a new indicator, which we termed open, opening, or being open to the what is new. At times, it looks like it is uh, um, one's personality. Whenever you refer to a new field of research, as if it could be nanotechnologies or biotechnologies. Um, nowadays, we could uh, mm, refer, for example, of artificial life uh, or genetic editing. So whenever such subjects are brought about, there are people who react very differently. And as a matter of fact, that there are those who can be more open to what is new. And uh, as you expect, young people are usually more open. And people with better education uh, are more open, not because they can avail themselves themselves or greater information, but because they are um, welcoming uh, innovation because they can manage the consequences and the negative consequences more swiftly. So um, since they have a greater training, they feel they cope with potential negative uh, repercussions. And this uh, was uh, what I felt I had to say. No. Uh, the chairman referred to this book kindly enough. This is um, a small book of mine called Per un pugno di idee, for a handful of ideas, where basically um, what I say is that, that to understand all innovations, digital innovations involved, we cannot just focus on technology. Technology obviously playing the lion's share when it comes to innovation, but there are other aspects all the same to be always considered as it, thus being, for example, society and culture. This is not just theory. This is something that has the direct repercussions to all of us. Um, now, to refer about something um, 
recent. You know, there has been a controversy between EU institutions and Apple, as Apple has been blamed not to pay taxes at its church. So if we'd like to understand um, other current uh, affair cases, and we've just heard, for example, that an innovation in just Uber is not just a new way to um, transport people, but it has to be seen in a social context where it may have different repercussions. It could be uh, ruled or um, could be left free of rules. So in this book, there are little stories, anecdotes that are told. And these stories basically all aim at uh, stating three main things. Innovation is a collective process. There is a myth of uh, the one who brings about innovator as if it were he were a madman um, with uh, strange ideas. This is not the, the truth because, as a matter of fact, innovation affects us all, at least as users. Innovation is not a linear process. It's a second assumption. And, and this is... Uh, the subject that we bring up when uh, I'm told uh, like uh, there could be unexpected consequences being brought about by innovation and that is going to be the responsibility of the innovator or the company developing that innovation. So all the charity, for example, that um, Gator and the Zuckerberg can put together. It's not that I don't trust these people, but the problem is that the innovator, and I'm going to tell you about a case, well, the innovator um, doesn't know what uh, he or she has invited. Thomas Edison, perhaps one of the greatest inventors worldwide, when he invented the phonograph, um, which is prehistory, but in a way it is the predecessor of the um, displayer. He uh, draws a list of things that it can be used for, and listening to music would be the last of his priorities. He thought that it could have been a way to, uh, for a manager to tell his assistants what to do. So again, innovation is a collective process, is a non-linear process, and that is very windy and uh, um, it includes uh, lots of ups and downs, but it also is a process of technological change and social and cultural change as well. Now, I'd like to show you a couple of videos, but wait a minute before you start the videos, and those are going to be the examples I'm going to refer to. So why should we focus on technology so much? Why should we just focus on that? Well, experts refer to that as technological determinism. If I ask you what has destroyed the um, disk industry, if I ask you why, then what would you answer me back? It is the internet, MP3. This would be the answer, wouldn't it? Well, if this is your answer and is often the case, well, you are wrong. There's a very famous actor um, and director, uh, um, a late actor and director, um, I start, who refers to technology determinism. I'm glad because young people are never happy. They want everything they want in first. Everybody is always in a hurry. Everybody wants to have everything uh, in the short term. The um, the tragedy of young people started uh, with the miniskirt. Perhaps also the disc player. Well, with all these things, you know, people just make love in the middle of the street. I don't know whether you're familiar with this movie. There's this young man that is being excessively protected by his mom for uh, trying to protect him for the other, for the rest of the world. And she starts out saying the tragedy of young people, starting with a mini skirt. And then um, the young man says, uh, the, display, the, the, the disc player as well. Again, the new technology is found guilty for all the evil things that have happened afterwards. 
Earlier on, I referred to the crisis of the disc industry. Well, MP3, we're all familiar with, which is the more widely disseminated format to listen to music nowadays. Well, MP3 was born in a very interesting, uh, under very interesting uh, circumstances. An Italian engineer, Chiarione, asked his colleagues to join him. He was looking for a way to share music, video, considering the constraints that existing at the time. A tender was uh, put together that was financed by all of us, uh, all the European institutions, and uh, the large size companies were all involved. And as a result, and I'm going to be a bit blunt on that, the result is just with an algorithm. And that algorithm basically um, uh, sacrifices certain, frequ certain frequencies that are not so important for the human year to the benefit of the mm, measure of the um, file. Two American people then um, set up a company using MP3. And that became a, and that triggered a legal action. So basically, they used uh, this MP3 to exchange music, and they developed a peer-to-peer -peer system. This triggers a process that led to the crisis of the um, industry of discs. But who was the killer? Was it Mr. Cariglione that uh, asked his colleagues uh, to put together this MP3, or were the uh, engineers that developed the MP3, or were the Napster people that uh, um, circulated that, or were the disc industry that underrated the importance of the process, or were perhaps the music listeners, the people listening to music, a new generation of people listen to music who basically um, forgot about the quality. If you ask an ex a sound expert about the MP3, you'll be told that it is terrible because it distorts sound. But innovation is the result of technology combined with a uh, change in society. So there was indeed a group of people that were willing to forgo part of the quality of sound um, for the sake of having the possibility to have music circulate. So who was the culprit? All and everybody, even the, Italian, the European taxpayers uh, that made the money available for this algorithm to be developed. And then Susan Vega, perhaps, a singer, because since the algorithm had to, to be tested, and uh, the most sophisticated uh, instrument is the uh, human voice, and uh, her song was used, Susan Vega's song was used to see whether the MP3 could pro come up with a satisfactory solution. Now, last anecdote. Highlighting again that, that innovation ca uh, cannot just be brought about through technology. This is an anecdote dating back to 1968. Um, I'm referring to the Olympic Games uh, in the Mexico City. So the athletes are getting ready for the last competition, and there is one of the athletes that is uh, jumping completely different. So everybody is jumping um, on their womb, and he would jump on his back. And uh, indeed, uh, the story of this video is uh, sometimes to innovate, you have to go backward because he was jumping on his back. He was the athlete uh, that um, actually um, marked an innovation so much so that that innovation is called after him. And he jumps on his back because uh, he cannot jump forward uh, as efficiently. Well, obviously, nobody has done that before, but luckily enough, and he was the innovator, and he was a lucky man because uh, mattresses were introduced, soft mattresses, because earlier on, uh, jumpers would fall on sand, and he would obviously be seriously hit if that was the case. But he perfected his technique. Uh, he got to the Olympic Games. Uh, he was... Uh, um, included in the team, and now we're going to see the last bit of the, the anecdote. Olympic Games proved to be a turning point in the history of the high jump event. Into the Mexico City Olympic Arena came not only a new name to the sport, but a new approach, which was to revolutionize the high jump event. 
Dick Fosbury from the United States demonstrated a new style of high jump which some considered strange and awkward. It was a jump he had devised in the previous years and one which unsettled his opponents. While the crowd at first saw him as a novelty, his continued success at clearing the ever-increasing height soon made it apparent he was a serious contender. Valentin Gavrilov from the Soviet Union failed at his attempt of 2.22 meters, while Fosbury and his US teammate Edward Carruthers cleared their way to a jump off. The bar sat at 2.24. Carruthers failed and Fosbury took his new style of high jump over the bar and into the history books. Fosbury had won his gold. Within a few years, the Fosbury flop had become the standard method of jumping in this great Olympic sport. Why is this anecdote interesting? Well, we're talking about innovation and sports. Obviously, never introduce technology. They're just something doing something differently compared to what has been the convention so far. There's another good lesson to be learned. You might think that the day after Fosbury's won, everybody would jump uh, his dial. Obviously, he was given the gold medal. Well, this did not happen. In 1972, at the, um, Munchen, uh, the, the Monaco um, Munich um, Olympic Games, everybody would still um, jump the same and not as uh, Fosbury. Pinocchio was referred to this morning, and uh, so people basically um, did not trust Fosbury and his medal adopting uh, his style. There's a risk if you just focus on technology. Perhaps we are too much focused on technology. Every revolution uh, requires discourse supporting it. The French Revolution brought it to renaming the months, for example. And what is the discourse for the digital revolution? Well, when historians will refer about what is happening over the years, they will probably refer to the entrepreneurship and uh, the courage of certain companies, but they will probably also refer to the discourse, to the way basically uh, the narration has been presented to the general public. These technologies being new or cool or uh, um, smart, hence they might not uh, be a uh, obliged to comply with the usual um, obligations uh, re respecting privacy, paying taxes, giving back profits, um, or uh, paying back musicians, or journalists, who have you. So this excessive focus on technology, which is something that involved us all, there's something that has displaced our political institution, digital Corporation obviously are um, pursuing their own interests. So, so basically, even the newspapers, the interest, the information network have been, in a way, mm, found themselves a bit at, at a loss. And uh, we have a journalist amongst us, uh, and uh, he knows what I'm referring to. So an excessive focus on technology, forgetting all the rest, has brought us to a situation where we are accepting this discourse. Obviously, I have no pre-packed solution. I don't think that we should close our eyes faced with technology and innovation. Obviously, all innovation, including the innovation of digital revolution, can um, create advantages and advantages. I think that three words should be added on condition that, because certain conditions must obtain for them being fruitful. In order to regulate an environment, well, that environment has to be understood. And this is the major challenge ahead of us. We have to understand before we pass laws or regulate. These technologies, for example, contributed into transforming certain habits we had, such as uh, um, reading the news, listening to the music, but these habits of ours have been transformed so much that we cannot recognize them anymore. And 
We believe that uh, since uh, they are easy to use, that means so that we can control them. Uh, obviously, any kid could use a touch phone, but certainly no kid of two can actually know how a touch or a smartphone works or a touch phone smart works. So using something doesn't mean you understand the way it operates. But uh, to regulate something, you have to understand. And with a fork, for example, we have a great innovation. It took 700 years for the fork to be widely disseminated. You might think it is incredible. You might think it incredible that there was a time when the fork wasn't used. Francis Bacon was wondering about innovation in the 1600s and said the time is the greatest innovator. Well, when you have an innovation, you might never think that there was a time when that wasn't there with you. You know, you know how many years passed from the time the first um, car casualty was caused and the time when the first regulation on the uh, car traffic uh, was uh, imposed. Um, so there was a steam car and a lady was the casualty of an accident. And it took 1966 before we had the first um, piece of legislation passed in the U.S. Uh, um, regulating the car industry. People were dying not because uh, cars were traveling too far, but the car industry would resist uh, the adoption of laws because uh, uh, they said that nobody is interested in safety and security. Everybody would be much more preoccupied with the cosmetic look of a car rather than with the safety. So it took the society 300 years to, for, to understand um, that people could die in the car and to legislate on that. So sometimes the technology is there, the society is not ready for something. The same goes with safety belt in the car that uh, were available m many more years before they became mandatory. There was a driver driving at a very fast speed and I hope that it won't take us a hundred years uh, to understand the culture that goes with innovation. I hope that we can have the culture that goes with the digital revolution before casualties are caused. Thank you.